Hello, it's James from xrobots.co.uk. This is part 11 of my 3D printed Star Wars droid project, which is an R6 droid. A majority of this is 3D printed. Have a look back through the previous episodes to see how it was made, obviously with the exception of the motors and electronics. And last time we put in quite a few features like the radar eye and some of these other logics and so on and some of the vents. And we also put some electronics in so that we can make lights flash and eventually there's going to be lots of animatronics and other things. But in order for that to work, uh, basically we need to add some functionality to the remote, which is a standard RC set. And I've got six channels on this. And what I need to do is hack into the spare two analog channels to make those into digital channels. So I can have lots of options on my droid that I can scroll through on a menu and lots of shortcut keys to make specific things happen. So let's take this apart and see what's inside. So here's my transmitter. It's a Flysky six channel transmitter. So we've got sticks that move in each direction, which make up the four channels. And then we've got two other knobs for the extra channels five and six. And I want to hack into those to send analog values straight in from a menu system and some buttons so that we can send those analog values straight in instead of turning the knob and read them at the other end to activate various functions. And I think I can break those channels up into at least 40 functions each, which will be quite good. So I've already taken the screws out. Let's uh, open this up. Oops. So this is the uh, battery pack, is there um, a bunch of double A's and that's actually got a connector where it comes off the board so we can separate that. And then we've got the back of the transmitter itself. So the knobs are these pieces here. And in fact, there's three wires to each one. So each one is a potential divider with zero and five volts and a sliding scale in the middle. So we should be able to um, easily hack into that center wire and send an analog value straight into the circuit board. We've also got two switches um, and these switches are just sensitivity. So when they're forward, the droid will drive more slowly, um, but we need to disable those because that will mess up the analog scaling. But that's just two wires that we need to leave disconnected. So easy. So let's have a look at some Arduino gear and work out how we're going to generate these analog values. So what I've got here is an Arduino Uno, which is a normal Arduino board. And I've also got, the other parts here are an Adafruit LCD shield kit. So this LCD gets mounted onto this board. It comes as a kit that you put together. There's various other components. And then this board plugs into the top of the Arduino. So it's all sort of put together as one module, which is quite good. And the beauty of this kit is that it only actually uses up two pins on the Arduino for I squared C, which is how it's controlled, leaving the others free so I can put other things on there like the buttons that I want. The shield itself actually has these little switches as well, which mount on here so you can actually control a menu system by pressing them and there's a select button. So you've got up, down, left, right and a select button. So we can actually use those buttons to control the LCD menu and then put some additional buttons on fed into the spare inputs of the Arduino that we can then um, read in, do some stuff. And we've got more than enough pins there to wire up about eight buttons and still have two PWM pins out to wire into the transmitter. As usual, Adafruit have the details of how to put this together and use it in their learning system. So here's um, obviously a much nicer picture of the kit and it tells you, you know, what all the parts are, what they do how it works. If we go onto the assembly page, you've got full instructions here for how to actually solder each component in place and what to do it, the placement of all those components, how exactly they should look when they're fitted. And this is, these are obviously, as you can see, quite detailed instructions of exactly how to fit it. Uh, we can see a picture of an Arduino Uno there. And it shows you how to put the whole thing together. So this is uh, really quite quite a lot of complete instructions. And there it is mounted um, on top of the Arduino Uno. The next page has all the downloads. So there's a, an Arduino library with example code. So it's really easy to program it. Um, and it gives you some hints here. I've got the RGB version of the LCD. So it tells you how to change the color of the backlight, how to read the little buttons that I mentioned and, and all sorts of other things. So um, this really is quite complete and gets you off to a good start with programming it. So um, it tells you how to wire it here as well to various different types of Arduino. So you don't have to plug it in as a shield. You could wire it up with wires, uh, but depending on which Arduino it's connected to, it tells you which pins are in use. And obviously in all of the cases, it's only power and two wires for I squared C, which is the serial communication. 
There's also an FAQ page that tells you um, lots of things and tells you how to solve common problems. So I'm going to get soldering and put that together and we'll see how it works. So I'm all soldered up. Obviously this is a shield so it plugs into the Arduino so it's got pins that mount this way and plugs neatly in to sort of piggyback on the back there. So I've got 5 volts here from one of those USB boost adapters. I've already put the default Hello World code onto the Arduino that controls this shield. So if we plug this in, it says Hello World, which is quite easy to read. The little uh, yellow adjuster there is to actually adjust the contrast on that. But so I've adjusted it up as best I can. And the um, sample code that comes with it allows you to press these menu buttons. So down, up, right, left, and select. And as it does so, it changes the colour of the LCD. Which is quite special. So that appears to be working. So we need to put some code on to um, do various things. But first of all, I need to try and mount this up onto the remote as well as some additional buttons. Great Scott Marty McFly, here's my remote control. So I've printed this piece of plastic out that as you can see has got multiple buttons mounted and my Arduino with its shield. So um, that's printed in ABS. It's fitted onto the back of the remote. And the remote body itself is made of ABS so I've chemically welded that on with acetone which is fixed on extremely well. I can still um, open the battery compartment and get to the screws to get to the inside. So what I've done is run out power here. So this is... Um, power from um, after the switch on the front which gives me nearly 12 volts so that's going to the V in of my Arduino there and the other buttons are all uh, mounted up so they're mounted up to ground and the green wires come out and those also go into the top of my Arduino to all of the input pins and the red wires coming out of the analog outs so that means I've got my menu that I can operate and I've got my quick shortcut keys on here which I've got 10 buttons. So um, let's have a look at some code of how we're going to actually make this whole thing work. I've got the standard Adafruit Hello World example for that LCD shield which sets up the entire LCD and makes everything work and it's got some quite simple code so the buttons make the display change as I showed you. So this sets up the libraries you need which is the wire H library which is for the I2C, the Adafruit MCP23017 chip which is on that shield and is an I2C breakout chip and the RGB LCD shield library. So the whole thing is set up here, there's some definitions for the colours for the display. Um, there's also a debugging output, so it uses a serial terminal with an Arduino so that you can um, get some data. In fact, they've put a note here, they're quite proud of the optimization, and in fact that um, serial terminal will give you um, some time. It tells you how long it takes this whole thing to run, which is quite interesting. So the main loop here um, basically is going to read the buttons and this is basically all there is to it. It's these um, five button functions for up, down, left, right and select. Um, and basically it's an if statement saying if you press button up, do print up to the screen and set the backlight to red. If you press down, print down and so on. Um, and so obviously you can put your own code into each of those button presses so that you can make this do something else and interact with your projects. So my plan for the menu system is effectively to have a menu for actions and a menu for sounds. So what we're going to have is uh, logically is two column, one's for action and one is for sounds. And then within each of those we'll have several things and we can scroll through the menu on each one. Um, and then we can press the select button over here and that will um, basically send an analog value out which will go straight into one of those pots. What I'd also like to be to do is instead of having to sort of go all the way down the menu, so I'm going to have about 12 things on each menu. So if I want to do an action then I want to play a sound and I want to play the bottom sound. I don't necessarily want to start at the top of the sound menu. So I'd actually really like to be able to go straight across like this. Which actually makes the coding a bit easier. So the plan is that we're going to um, divide up our analog scale, which is um, 
in the range 0 to 255 into um, basically notches of the value of 10, which um, gives us a bit of space between the analog values and means they'll be easier to identify when they come out of the radio control receiver at the other end. So what I'm going to do um, is have uh, um, several variables we add together so we can have a an offset of 0 on our actions and an offset of 130 on our sounds. Each one of these is going to be worth 10, which means when we add our sort of functions to our menu columns, we get unique values. So this one will have maybe 12, which goes up to 120. The next column starts at 130. Each of these are worth 10 as well, and that eventually takes us up to a top value of 250. So let's explain that in code, and then we'll see how it works. So here's my modified button code, and what I've actually done here is um, basically when you press the left button, it's the actions menu, and when you press the right button, it's the sounds menu. So it writes out actions in text, and there's also some trailing spaces there which blank out the rest of the display to save me clearing the display every time. It changes the backlight to green for actions and red for sounds. And basically I've got a column variable, so if I go and press the actions button, or I scroll to the left, basically it takes 130 away to remove that offset. And if I press the right hand button, it adds 130. And I've done it this way so that I can add more columns to this in the future if I want to. And I've actually constrained that variable in each case, so it can't go more than 130 or less than 0, so it doesn't go negative or keep counting up impossibly high. Now, the similar thing happens with the up and down buttons. So basically there's a function variable there, and uh, when I press up it takes away 10, and when I press down it adds 10. So that means I can scroll through that, uh, those functions in each menu, and again those are constrained so they don't go bigger than 120 in each case. Then all the select button does is write out that value, so it prints it and adds together the column value and the function value, with some trailing spaces, and then it does an analog write on pin 5 for that exact same number. So bear in mind that every menu item has a unique number, and those actual numbers are the analog value that we write out, so that basically when you press select it writes it out to the analog pin, and that will go straight into the pot on my remote. What I've also done right at the top of the code is defined a load of values for my other colourful buttons that I've got on there, and there are 10 of them all together on the other pins, obviously avoiding pins 5 and 6, which are the analogue out pins. So um, what I've done there is define them all as input pull-up, which uses internal pull-up resistors to pull them to 5 volts. Um, I've done a digital read on every single one of them, and bear in mind when you press them it takes them to ground. And then I've done a bunch of if statements to say if the button is low, then so if the first one is low, then our button value is 10. If the next one is low, it's 20, 30, 40, and so on. So again, these buttons have unique values all the way up to 100. Then I've done an analog write. So basically I've done taken that exact value and written it out onto pin 6, which is the second spare PWM pin that will go into my second pot, my second channel on the transmitter. Um, and again, that writes that value to the screen um, in a specific place. These um, set cursor positions, that means that it's the first row and the 13th column. So it writes it over to the top right of the display. And again, there's some trailing spaces there to blank out the previous value. Um, and the rest of this code is, the, uh, of course, the button values and writing to pin 5. So that's really all there is to it. Don't forget that this code is um, free and open for anyone to use. Have a look at part 7a of my droid build to find out how you can get the digital downloads for this and the CAD files. So here we are all hooked up. I've got my multimeter hooked to the analog out wire from the LCD. I've got another wire there which isn't connected to anything for the buttons, but I'll show you how this one works. The other one's exactly the same. So when we turn this on, first of all, um, it's says R6 droid control, of course the Arduino is run from the same batteries as the transmitter. So it defaults to the actions menu, if I press the right hand button I get the sounds menu, and of course left again goes to actions. So now I can scroll up and down through the actions with the up and down buttons, and all that does is prints the value to the screen there, so uh, basically these are my function values that go vertically through the menus. If I scroll to um, sounds, it's exactly the same. 
But if I select, so let's go for 60 and we'll press select. So that basically outputs a value of, an analog value of 60, uh, which gives me 1.18 volts. And roughly every 10 is um, 0.2 volts. So if we um, go down to sort of 40, yeah, we get 0.8 volts. So if I then go to the other menu, so I go to sounds and press select, then we get a value of 170, so we get 40 plus the offset of 130, and we get 3.31 volts, so that's different to the 40 on the actions menu. So it's important here that all of the values are unique for each option on the menu, um, so that we can basically read those as unique PWM value, values at the receiving end. So obviously I can go all the way up to um, 130 on the sounds menu with an offset of 130, which gives me 250 and gives me almost 5 volts. So similarly, the buttons um, are wired in as well. So if I press these, the top value on here changes. So that's 10, 20, 30, 40, all the way up to 100. So I've only got 10 buttons and 10 increments. Um, and that analog value is written out to the other cable. So all I need to do is wire those red cables into my potentiometers instead of turning these knobs. We'll use these buttons and then we'll see what comes out at the other end. So I've just come to wire the red wires to the transmitter on the inside, which is basically means desoldering the wiper on the pot and soldering this on instead to send the analog value in where the pot was. Uh, but this uh, transmitter's actually got a USB interface, so it's got a cable that plugs in and it goes into a laptop or whatever. And it's got some software that lets you monitor what the um, individual controls are doing. And you can see there, channel 5 is very jittery. And if I press one of my coloured buttons, so is 6. Um, and the reason for that is that the analog out of the Arduino isn't actually an analog out, it's PWM, so it's pulse width modulated. And what we can see there is the jitter of the PWM turning on and off really quickly. So what I'm actually going to do is smooth that out with an electrolytic capacitor. So I've tried various values. I've got these which are 470 microfarads. I'm just going to put those in between the signal pin and the ground pin or zero volts on that pot, which is what this is here. And um, I'll just point the camera back at the screen there. So as soon as I connect this wire, the jitter almost goes away. If I can just hold it, there we go. So it holds that value stable. So um, that's what we really need. Otherwise, the output's going to jitter as well. It'll be really confusing to read. So I'm going to end up soldering those two pots in and hopefully I can fit them inside the transmitter there. All right, here they are neatly fitted inside. So just uh, to recap, they go between the ground and the actual signal pin coming in. Just before we try and um, see what comes out of the other end of the droid ends, I've actually printed these, which are Ninja Flex, and they're not just Ninja Flex. They're printed with dual extruders as a hybrid print, so they are Ninja Flex with some black ABS bonded to the back there, uh, basically in the print, so they're all bonded as one piece, and that means I can acetone weld these onto another ABS piece. And those are going to go at the back of my transmitter, like that, and I've got another one coming which is going to go up here. And that basically gives me a nice bumper to put this down on so I don't put it down on the contacts on the switches and also something to grip it by instead of by these bits of smooth plastic. I'm now at the back of the droid and I've got my nice bumpers on my controller so I can put it down on the floor. So I've got a normal radio control servo plugged into one of the channels. It's on a very long lead but it goes into the radio control receiver so if we just put that there, and you should hopefully be able to see, as I press buttons on the transmitter, it moves a different distance, and it gets further and further as I press different buttons, which means it's obviously um, sending a different signal with a different PWM ratio. Similarly, if I plug it into the other channel, which is now using the LCD, uh, basically we get a very similar thing, so as I step up through the values, we should be able to see it moving to different positions. 
I've connected those two channels, 5 and 6, on the radio control receiver to the second Arduino in the droid, and I've just put a simple piece of code on it here, uh, which uses pulse in to read both those channels, and then it writes them out to the serial terminal so I can monitor the values. I've commented out the second channel here, I'm only monitoring one at a time, so that I can work out what those values are. And the idea is we'll read those values into a variable, and then we can put a bunch of if statements to make each one do different things. So you can see the... Um, Serial terminal here with the values ticking away, so this is no buttons pressed. If I press a couple of buttons, we can see that value changes. And as I press buttons higher and higher up, it gets higher and higher and higher. So all I need to do is write all those values down. You'll notice that they vary slightly, so... That one is somewhere between 1158 and 1166. But that's okay, because there's lots of space in between them. So we've got there 1138 to 11. 40 roughly so we can have uh, an if statement that says if the values within these bounds do a certain thing I just need to write down what all of those are and then do the same for my menu option on the other channel So here's my droid you can see his uh, Arduino serial flashing away there on the bottom Arduino And I've got that grey USB connector all cabled into my laptop with the serial monitor running so I can see the values And I've written down all of the values there for the buttons and all of the values there for the menu options and you can see they're quite widely spaced so we've got th uh, for option 100 on the menu we've got option uh, value of 1309 to 16 then for 110 it doesn't start again the lowest is 1366 so there's quite a bit of space in between them so we could squeeze some more options in the menu probably double or triple the amount if we wanted so now I've made um, a modification to my original NeoPixel code, which also runs on the Arduino. So it's now reading in the values from the menu and doing some stuff. So if I change my actions menu here and I clock up to a value of 10 and press select, we should see all those NeoPixels in both the Logix and the Holo projector turn red. So basically it's taking out the other colours. If I go up to 20 on my actions menu, they should all go blue. And if I go back to zero, they should go back to multicolored again. So going back to my NeoPixel code that I wrote last time, um, which is fairly horrendous and needs optimizing, and that was using the Adafruit NeoPixel library to set all those pixel colors. Uh, what I've done here is additionally added in to read in those two channels. So we're reading in pins 2 and pins 4 as channels 5 and 6, which are variables. And then we're only looking at channel 6 for now, but we're saying if it's less than 1052, which is the bottom value you get for 0 on the menu, then set all of the RGB to random values. If it's 1055 to 1068, which is the value for 10 on the menu, then basically make green and blue zero and only set red to a random number and similarly the next one which is 20 on the menu set blue to a random number and the others to zero so the whole set of logics goes blue. So that really leaves me with one decision um, left to make about how this is coded. So, so far when I select these menu options and I press select basically that permanently sets an analog value into one channel. When I press the buttons, it only sets an analog value while I'm holding the button. So um, basically those are momentary presses. So probably what I need to do is decide that either both channels do the same. So they're either um, a momentary output, so I just put a timer on when I press select on here to only output that value for a short time, which is long enough for it to be read at the receiving end, or I make sure these get toggled. So um, in code, once I've pressed the button, it holds it till I select another option. I think I'm probably gonna go for them both being momentary presses because I want these buttons to be scrolling up and down to the next R2D2 track. So um, basically they need to function and function again. It's no good waiting for another different button to be pressed before it changes because I need to keep firing the same next track command. So probably what we'll do is put a timer on the output of this so when we press the button it just brings that analog output up for say 100 milliseconds then the other end it can read it once and decide what to do. So that's the end of another R2-D2 episode. Next time we're going to get a couple of soundboards in there so we can use both the scroll buttons for R2-D2 sounds and the sounds option on the menu to play music tracks which we can do with polyphonic sounds. So don't forget to subscribe to my channel and check out my other projects as well. If you'd like to support my projects, you can fund me through my Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash xrobots, where you can get access to some exclusive rewards, including a live broadcast with me and all my digital downloads for free.